on World News Tonight. Oppressive rule. India's NCP leader Rahul Gandhi sentenced to jail for Modi Thieves' remark. Indigenous referendum. Australia PM unveils plan of historic constitution vote. Big steps forward. Sunak's Brexit deal clears Commons vote despite Tory revolt. And Ramadan curry. The world's Muslim community prepares for the holy month of fasting. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening to you this Thursday night. Now, Indian opposition leader Rahul Gandhi has been sentenced to two years in prison in a criminal defamation case. A court in Western India found opposition leader Rahul Gandhi guilty of defamation for a speech he made in 2019 in which he referred to thieves as having the surname Modi and sentenced him to two years in prison. Now, Gandhi was present at the court in Surat, a city in Gujarat, which is Prime Minister Narendra Modi's home state. He was given bail and the sentence was suspended for 30 days. Gandhi would appeal against a verdict in a higher court, the president of his Congress party said on Twitter, calling Modi's government cowardly and dictatorial. The criminal defamation case was filed against Gandhi by a leader of the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party after a speech during the 2019 general election in which he referred to the surname Modi and asked how all thieves had the surname. Gandhi said in court that he made the comment to highlight corruption and not against any community. Gandhi is one of the main opposition leaders in the country who will go up against Modi when he seeks his third term as Prime Minister in 2024. Gandhi's once dominant Congress controls less than 10% of the elected seats in Parliament's lower house and has lost badly to the BJP in two successive general elections, most recently in 2019. Modi remains India's most popular politician by a substantial margin and is widely expected to win a third victory at the next general election in 2024. Now, Australia took a step towards a historical referendum to give Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders recognition in the Constitution and for the first time, a voice on matters that affect their lives. In an emotional address, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese revealed the question the government wants to set in the referendum later this year, urging Australians to back what he described as a long overdue vote. The referendum question is to be put to Australians will be a proposed law to alter the constitution to recognise the first peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Do you approve this proposed alteration? Making up about 3.2% of Australia's near 26 million population, the Aboriginal people were marginalised by British colonial rulers and are not mentioned in the 122-year-old constitution. They were not granted voting rights until the 1960s and tracked below national averages on most socio-economic measures. Albanese urged Australians who will be asked to vote between October and December to amend the constitution to create a consultative committee on parliament called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voice. The committee would prove non-binding advice to Parliament on matters that affect First Nations people. The government will introduce the bill next week, hoping to pass it in the Parliament by the end of June. Any constitutional alterations require a national referendum. Now crossing over to the UK, the United Kingdom's Parliament passed a key part of the government's new post-Brexit trade deal on Northern Ireland, despite opposition from the region's major unionist party. A law aimed at breaking the deadlock between the UK and the EU over the Northern Ireland Protocol has passed in the British Parliament, despite a rebellion from 22 government MPs. 515 voted for and 29 against. The measure aims to ease post-Brexit trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which remains inside the EU's internal market for goods. The passing of the so-called Windsor Framework is a major victory for Prime Minister Rishi Sunak in a battle with Brexit hardliners within his own party. The reworked protocol is seen as a stepping stone to improve overall relations with the EU. But it's deeply unpopular with many Northern Ireland unionists who regard it as undermining the region's status as part of the UK. Their DUP representatives voted against it and have indicated that they'll continue to boycott the local assembly until the protocol is further modified. The wider population generally supports the arrangement and the access it gives to the single market.
Now, still in the UK, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson angrily denied he lied to Britain's Parliament over the Partygate scandal as MPs held an inquisition that could decide his political fate. It is well established that the MP for Uxbridge and South Ryslip stood at the dispatch box and misled the House of Parliament amid the Partygate scandal. But on Wednesday, Boris Johnson faced a parliamentary committee hoping to prove that he did not do so intentionally or recklessly. I apologise. I apologise for inadvertently misleading this House. But to say that I did it recklessly or deliberately is completely untrue, as the evidence shows. The committee played a montage of Johnson's repeated denials that gatherings in Downing Street broke the rules. That all guidance was followed uh, completely during number 10. Since the denials, a report by a senior civil servant found several gatherings should not have been allowed to happen, and the Metropolitan Police fined Boris Johnson, finding his birthday party illegal. He has rigidly stuck to his defence that he did not know the events in question broke the rules even deflecting onto Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. If it was obvious to me that these events were contrary to the guidance and the rules, and it must have been obvious to others in the building, including the current Prime Minister. The committee dredged up photos, pointing to the absence of social distancing, but Johnson's response was to insist that this too was a work event. I believe it was absolutely essential for work purposes. If the committee finds Johnson to have intentionally misled Parliament, they could recommend sanctions, including suspension. Any sanctions, though, would have to be voted by an overwhelmingly conservative Parliament. The many gatherings in Downing Street occurred as Britain racked up one of the world's highest COVID death tolls, with more than 175,000 deaths by the end of Johnson's premiership. Now, follow-up measures to mend economic ties between Seoul and Tokyo pick up speed as Japan is expected to conclude procedures to lift its export restrictions on South Korea. And the same goes for the other entangled issues in the near future, like the trade whitelist. Economic relations between South Korea and Japan are on the mend. Industry Minister Lee Chang-yang announced on Wednesday that the procedure is expected to be concluded this week for Japan to lift its export bans and for Korea to withdraw the complaint filed with the World Trade Organization in response. In 2019, Japan imposed restrictions on the exporting to Korea of three crucial semiconductor components, hydrogen fluoride, fluorinated polyamide, and EUV photoresist, in retaliation to a Korean Supreme Court ruling ordering Japanese companies to compensate victims of wartime forced labor. The same year, Japan went on to drop South Korea from its export whitelist of countries that are allowed expedited export procedures. South Korea responded by also removing Japan from its own whitelist. The country will now begin the procedure to add Japan back to its list of preferential trade partner countries sometime this week. In response to potential concerns about Korea starting the whitelist reinstatement process before Japan, the industry minister said that focusing on who makes the first move is irrelevant, given what benefits mended economic relations could bring to both nations. He also added that the process could take less than two months, as it usually would. This comes on the heels of a rare bilateral summit held in Tokyo last week between South Korean President Yoon suk yeol and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. Seoul is expecting the warmer ties to boost business relations and investments between the two countries as well as help both nations strengthen their supply chains. Let's go for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Welcome back. Now, French President Emmanuel Macron broke his silence on the bitter pension battle roiling the country in a televised interview, stressing that his contentious reform raising the pension age is necessary and will come into force later this year. Macron refuses to back down over the pension age rise as a defiant leader wants the pension bill plan implemented by the end of the year, regardless of how unpopular he is. French President Emmanuel Macron drew an angry response from unions and opposition parties on Wednesday when he said he would press on with plans to raise the pension age despite fury among many French people. 
In his first public comment since pushing through the bill, Macron said in a televised interview he was undeterred. Donc, oui. And so this reform is necessary. And I say this to the French people, I don't enjoy doing this. I would have preferred not to do this. But it's also because of a sense of responsibility that I express my commitment to do this in front of you. The comments did little to smooth things over. On Wednesday, protesters blocked train stations. In Nice, an effigy of Macron was laid on the tracks and thrown into the air. Polls show a wide majority of French are opposed to the pension legislation. And the past six nights have seen fierce demonstrations across France with bins set ablaze and scuffles with police. Macron insists reform is needed to ensure the pension system does not go bust. But this union leader said the new law, pushed through parliament without a vote last week, and which raises the pension age by two years to 64, needs to be stopped. How can we hear that the street has no legitimacy? How can we hear that the pension reform, despite all the protests, will continue to be implemented? How can we legitimize this crime of democracy with these announcements? No, it has stirred up more hatred. Socialist Party lawmaker Olivier Faure said Macron is creating the chaos. Macron says he wants to re-engage with union leaders. This union member said she's open to talks. But before that, a ninth nationwide day of protests and strikes is set for Thursday, according to union organizers, with massive disruptions expected to train travel, airports and schools. Now, just a day after Chinese President Xi Jinping concluded his trip to Russia for what he called peace talks, a Russian drone strike hit a high school in the Kyiv region, killing four and injuring seven others. According to Ukraine's state emergency service, the drone attack also partially destroyed two floors used as a residence for high school students. Russia blasted an apartment block in Ukraine with missiles on Wednesday and swarmed cities with drone attacks overnight. In a display of force, as President Vladimir Putin bid farewell to his visiting dear friend and Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping. Security camera footage captured the moment a Russian missile slammed into the side of an apartment building in the Ukrainian city of Zaporizhia. Flames explode from the blast, followed by plumes of smoke as pedestrians flee in terror. Journalists filmed the aftermath of the shattered building. Resident Ivan Nalavaiko said, When I got out, there was destruction, smoke, people screaming, debris. Then the firefighters and rescuers came. 81-year-old Oleksandra Pavlova said she was lucky she made it to the hallway after the blast destroyed her home. Sitting in an ambulance, she said, I have nowhere to sleep. A local official said the strike left one dead and 33 injured, including three children. And at a hospital outside Kyiv, a teacher is treated for burns from a Russian strike on a dormitory. The bombardment came as Xi wrapped up his visit to Moscow. Hosting Xi this week was Putin's grandest diplomatic gesture since he launched the war a year ago and became a pariah in the West. The two men referred to each other as dear friend, promised economic cooperation, condemned the West, and described relations as the best they have ever been. She departed, telling Putin, quote, now there are changes that haven't happened in 100 years. When we are together, we drive these changes. Washington criticized the timing of the trip just days after the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for Putin on war crimes charges. In Washington Wednesday, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken told a Senate committee that the world was watching this war to see whether or not Russia's aggression would win the day or go down in defeat. The stakes in Ukraine go well beyond Ukraine. I think if China is looking at this, and they are looking at it very carefully, they will draw lessons for how the world comes together or doesn't to stand up to this aggression. Despite the bloodiest fighting of the war, which both Ukraine and Russia describe as a meat grinder, the front line has barely moved for four months. Now, people who identify as gay in Uganda risk life in prison after Parliament passed a new bill to crack down on homosexual activities. It also includes the death penalty in certain cases. The bill is one of the toughest pieces of anti-gay legislature in Africa. 
Members of Uganda's LGBTQ community are in shock and afraid for their lives after Parliament passed a new bill that would make it a crime merely to identify as LGBTQ. The anti-homosexuality bill passed with a near-unanimous majority on Tuesday. Same-sex relations are already illegal in Uganda and over 30 other African countries. The new law would introduce steep sentences, life in prison for same-sex relations, and the death penalty for aggravated homosexuality, which according to the bill involves gay sex with people under 18 or when the perpetrator is HIV positive, among other categories. Advocate Frank Mugisha is one of a few Ugandans who live openly as gay. His charity for LGBTQ rights was shut down last year. The last time the legislation was around, there were cases of suicide. So this time, this law is worse than the one that was here before because it has the death penalty. And many people would be worried, many people would be scared. Supporters say it is needed to punish a broader array of LGBTQ activities, which they say threaten traditional values. The law also bans promoting and abetting homosexuality, as well as conspiracy to engage in homosexuality. U.S. Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre noted grave concerns about Uganda's bill on Wednesday. If the AHA is signed into law and enacted, it would impinge upon universal human rights, jeopardize progress in the fight against HIV AIDS, deter tourism and invest in Uganda and damage Uganda's international reputation. The legislation will soon be sent to Uganda's president, Yoweri Museveni, to be signed into law. He has repeatedly denounced homosexuality. If the law is signed by the president, the worst would be mass and mass um, arrests of LGBTQ persons, mob violence towards the LGBTQ community, uh, um, putting LGBT persons, I don't know if they're going to be concentration camps or rehabilitation centers that are so uh, discriminatory because many people are going to be internally displaced. Mugisha said he would challenge the law in court on the grounds that it is unconstitutional and violates various international treaties to which Uganda is a signatory. We will go to all courts in Uganda. If need be, we'll go to the international court as well. But we definitely have to go to court and challenge this law. Thousands are protesting in Israel over Prime Minister Netanyahu's plans to reform the country's Supreme Court. The U.S. is also putting pressure on the country after a new law could clear the way for fresh Jewish settlements in the West Bank. Tonight, Israel's right-wing government under mounting pressure at home and abroad. Demonstrators back on the streets, the latest in a months-long wave of protests against government plans to weaken the Israeli Supreme Court. At the center of the storm, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who commands a majority in parliament but is facing strong resistance from across Israeli society. These grandmothers for democracy proving you're never too old to protest. I don't want what's happening in Russia to happen here, she says. Netanyahu's supporters today mounting a small pro-government protest outside the court. We demand for the government to proceed, to continue with the judicial reform and not to stop. Far-right members of Netanyahu's government also pushing through a change to Israeli law, clearing the way for new settlements in the northern West Bank. Israel forced settlers out of the area in 2005 and promised the Bush administration they would not return. Now the Biden administration accusing Israel of going back on its word. The legislative changes announced today are particularly provocative and counterproductive. The action also represents a clear contradiction of undertakings the Israeli government made to the United States. The U.S. fears it will exacerbate violence heading into the Islamic holy month of Ramadan, with Palestinian militants already mounting attacks in the West Bank and Israel. And Israeli forces carrying out deadly raids in the heart of Palestinian cities. Netanyahu looking for middle ground between his supporters and a frustrated White House, saying he welcomes an end to a discriminatory and humiliating law that prohibited Jews from living in the areas of the northern West Bank, but adding the government has no intention of establishing new settlements in these areas. Netanyahu showing no sign of backing down on his judicial overhaul. But neither of the protesters, young and young at heart, taking to the streets against him.
Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Taiwan's armed forces held joint handy landing exercises close to Taoyuan International Airport in the north of the island. The drills come amid heightened military posturing and threats towards Taiwan by its giant neighbor China. Relatively Space's 3D printed rocket lifted off for the first time, passing a key milestone to demonstrate the vehicle's in flight strength before its second stage failed upon reaching space. Eyewitness video shows debris swirling around a small tornado in Southern California town of Montebello. Cars were left with smashed windows and parts of a warehouse rooftop swept through the parking lot. The storm marked the 12th so-called atmospheric river since December to sweep the U.S. West Coast. A Peruvian rescue worker was injured when the freezer fell on him and hit him while he was searching for missing persons in Lima. Officer Jerry Loyola, who had climbed down the Rimac River in search of two missing, was knocked unconscious after a freezer and debris falling from one of the houses damaged by the landslide hit him. Norway pledges support for Brazilian efforts to attract additional donor countries for the Amazon Fund that it helped to set up for fighting deforestation and spur sustainable development. The fund, launched in 2009, was frozen in 2019 by former far right President Jair Bolsonaro who abolished its governing board and action plans. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can always watch the entire program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. Now, those of the Islam faith around the world began their month of Ramadan with the sighting of the new moon over Mecca in Saudi Arabia. We leave you tonight with sights of Muslims in Israel's Jerusalem getting ready for their holy month of fasting. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.